Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next edition of our career videos. I am Tracy Walker. I'm the Education Programs Lead, and I'm super excited to have the opportunity to talk to so many of my colleagues and introduce them to you. Wherever you're joining us from, we are in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is in Treaty 6 territory. It's the homeland of the Métis and the Nehawak, Anishinaabek, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and Dene nations. And we are happy that we can all work and play together in this land. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to one of our very interesting people at CLS, um, Rob Norris. So hello, Rob. Can Hi, you, Tracy. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you please tell us what your title is at CLS? Yeah, Tracy, I'm, I'm honored to, to be the Senior Government Relations Officer at the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron. And of course, as, as you've said, the, the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron is on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland is the Métis. It's also uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. And that's important when we think about reconciliation because the university was built actually square on a trail that ran between uh, the Métis community of Batash and an indigenous community uh, out at Moose Woods. And that is um, part of our history uh, located in a very real sense on this campus. And so for us, reconciliation is about a spirit of moving forward together, but it also, it's a reminder that uh, our very existence here on this campus uh, comes uh, with very, very rich history. Thank you for that story. I learn more every time. It's great. Can you help me understand what government relations means? Sure. <laughs> I think it maybe is, is just simply two simple concepts. We do world leading science led by world leading scientists, the, the first in class scientists at the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron. And my job is really twofold. I get to help tell their stories and I get to serve as a champion. And I get to take those stories into provincial capitals like the legislature in Regina, but I also get to take it and, and use those stories in places like the Parliament of Canada, in the Canadian Embassy in Washington and around the world. And why we do that is we try to make sure that uh, Canadians and others understand the significance of the science that's underway. We couldn't do our science and our scientists couldn't do their work without public monies, public investment. And so for us, it's about, well, some people would call it, what's the return on investment? But really I think it's what important discoveries and research and science is underway that's helping to make our world a little better whether that's fighting cancer or, or COVID, maybe helping crops grow, increasing prosperity here at home and around the world, finding better, cheaper, stronger materials to help, whether it's uh, ensure that we're manufacturing cars that are more fuel efficient or helping mining operations that have a smaller carbon footprint. And along the way, we get to have some really interesting fun. We get to work with organizations like NASA that put satellites up in the, you know, in the heavens and our scientists help in their own very specific way, ensure that the materials can withstand the forces that are put upon those satellites. Every day is different and the stories, well, they're among the most compelling in the world. You sound like storytelling is an important part of, of who you are. You know, I, I had the privilege of, of arriving back at the University of Saskatchewan in 1999. Uh, and I was um, working in our international office on campus. And of course, in 1999, that's when the groundbreaking occurred for the Canadian Light Source. So in a sense, I was present at creation and I understood immediately thanks to the leaders that were around at that time, both at the Canadian Light Source and at the university and within government, that this was going to be really, really important, really special. This was a moment in time, well, really 
that wasn't going to be replicated, at least in my lifetime. And that was going to change the profile, people's understanding of what the University of Saskatchewan had to offer, already a very, very strong university, and now suddenly the home of Canada's synchrotron. So it took me uh, just, just a little while to begin to understand what that meant, that people were going to be more interested in the university, more interested in the Canadian light source, and increasingly interested in the science that was undertaken. So do you have a typical day? You know, I, I would say that, that I've kind of seen the synchrotron in, through three or four lenses. When I was uh, young and early in my career, uh, I was attached to the international office on campus and I would share stories of the synchrotron and we would undertake tours of the synchrotron. And so that typical day was maybe spending an hour or two at the Canadian Light Source, maybe once or twice a week, taking ambassadors or other scientists, university administrators, some business people through, and really beginning to get an understanding of the significance of the, the potential, the scientific potential. So that was one lens. Second lens was I had the privilege of, of being elected and serving in Premier Wall's government as minister responsible for advanced education and innovation, among other things. And suddenly I got to see the synchrotron through a governmental lens. And so that meant visiting the synchrotron on special days where maybe investments were being made or discoveries were being celebrated. And that was a really unique lens and a privilege. When I came back to campus uh, after my, my time in government, I was spending kind of three quarters of my time in a number of centers of excellence, including the Canadian Light Source in and around campus. And suddenly I began to be more engaged, both within the building, but also seeing the potential of what it meant around the world. For example, uh, we helped uh, lead an initiative uh, with our CEO, Rob Lamb and others, where the Canadian Light Source became part of a, uh, a collection, a group of synchrotrons that helped support and continue to help support uh, a synchrotron in the Middle East, right in Jordan called Sesame. So that was about getting on airplanes, making the case, and really trying to help ensure that we were serving the Canadian light source, but also serving Canada's broader interest. And more recently, I spend my days at the Canadian light source, and it's a real privilege. That means being there, well, especially during COVID, very long hours, trying to make sure that we continue to tell our stories. Few challenges, obviously, it's different when you can't meet face to face, as we're experiencing today but working as hard as we can with our scientists to make sure that we continue to tell our great stories about the science that continues, including fighting COVID, more than 20 different science projects underway, trying to help make sure that therapeutics, that means really uh, that drug therapies uh, are more effective and, and help support those suffering from COVID, to making sure the efficacy of PPE, that just means that PPE continues to work, after it's being washed and cleaned to any number of other initiatives to help in this battle, global battle against COVID. So there's a snapshot of kind of four different ways of, of spending my time with the Canadian Light Source. So it's interesting because as I hear you tell these stories and talk about your experiences from different lenses, I hear references to several different careers that are kind of related to the work that you do. Um, could you maybe mention some of, the, some of the different ways that someone who's very young, maybe still in high school, can think about where to go and, and career opportunities that are related to your line of work? Sure, I, I think uh, the important piece is, um, I don't have a formal background in science. I'm a political scientist by training, but what's important no matter what your background is, science plays a key role. And if we just stand back and just think about it, really it's about science and engineering, uh, the roads that enable us to travel in our communities or between communities. Uh, it's science that allows us to, to lead the healthy lives that we have. It's science that ensures that we have uh, the nutritious diets that we have today 
and continue to focus on ways to make sure that others around the world continue to have those nutritious diets. Essentially, science silently, quietly surrounds us. And uh, it's about being curious and it's about being open-minded and it's about recognizing that like a hockey team or, or maybe a football team, everyone has a job to do. And the privilege I have is I have well, the, the fortune of being able to tell really remarkable stories that feature remarkable scientists and the work they do. But scientists, they're often so pressed for time, so driven by excellence that they need a hand in helping to tell their stories and making, well, making sure that people, taxpayers and others understand the significance of their work. And that's maybe where I come in and I don't do it alone. I do it uh, with a team. And Tracy, you're part of that team where we can get out and tell the stories and make sure people understand. We can't take it for granted. Make sure people understand the work is so significant. It's actually ensuring that the quality of life that we enjoy today, well, that that can continue and even get better and that it can be shared more broadly around the world. Great. Thank you, Rob. Could you tell us about your education path? You know, what you learned in high school and then you went to university and, and what has your path been like? You know, it's it, a lot of twists and turns. Um, and and if there was if there's one regret that I have, it is it is that I did not uh, take as many sciences as I could have or, or should have. That being said, I was very fortunate to, uh, to go to a high school that allowed me in, uh, in the mornings to take welding and automotives. And, uh, you know, that was as I, as I got started in high school and, and really try to understand, if you want, uh, applied science and industrial science to, to courses like philosophy and, and those in the humanities while touching on, on chemistry and biology and other sciences. And so I didn't have a notion that one day I would have the privilege of, of serving at the, the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron uh, because in fact, I didn't know what a synchrotron was. And I guess if there's maybe one, one lesson that I've learned and I go through this every day is maybe some people are asking high school students and others, what they want to be, essentially, what door do they want to go through? And my only, well, my only kind of offering, and it's modest, is this. There are doors that we don't know about. And as we're making decisions about careers, rewarding careers, um, take your time and maybe be a bit patient and a lot curious because uh, there are likely careers you're going to have in your life that don't exist today. And part of it is that you get to create them and be pathfinders, be the very first in what those careers can look like for yourselves and for others. And so um, it's a way of not feeling too pressured just to explore a little. Thinking about pressures, um, do, you, uh, do you find your field of work to be stressful? I, I would say it's performance-based. Uh, which means uh, rather than the word stress, I, I, I would kind of frame it as challenging. Um, we might have to work all day, pre-COVID especially, uh, catch a plane at, at five or six uh, in the early evening, uh, get to Ottawa maybe by 1 a.m., be up for a, a 7 a.m. breakfast, be ready to roll, uh, and then spend the day um, maybe making it uh, to, to bed that night at 10 or 11 uh, and spend all day speaking to parliamentarians and, and senior governmental decision makers, maybe some industrial leaders. And so uh, that for me is about being up to the challenge. And part of that is just physical endurance. Part of that is making sure that we know the material cold. I can remember flying to China and and reading and reading and reading and proofing and preparing. And the reason for that was I was literally getting off the plane after a 14 hour flight and literally walking into a meeting 
where I was going to be representing the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron and, and some other centers of excellence uh, from our campus. And so uh, preparation and a tireless pursuit of excellence, that's not working by myself. I keep in mind and I try to be really mindful uh, and humbled by the dedication and hard work of our scientists. It can be three o'clock in the morning and they're still working. They're still pursuing their dreams and their goals and objectives. In fact, one of our scientists just pulled me aside. He finally uh, got a result that he had been hoping for. And I said, it sounds like an overnight success story. And he said, yeah, an overnight success story, 10 years in the making, <laughs> Friday nights and weekends, time away from family uh, in order to see one result in one experiment. And so I, I carry that kind of spirit with me my job is to do my very best. And so um, it's performance-based, it's challenging, but boy, it's rewarding. So how do you manage those late nights and long hours? You know, one of the things that we have to do um, is, and I compare it maybe to, to athletes, is, is there's, there's some physical discipline that we need. There's also intellectual discipline that we need. Uh, and we need to make sure that uh, we, we stay healthy, we are working as diligently as we can, and we need to make sure that we understand the strategic environment within which we're working. And if you're flying uh, or across the country or around the world, that's going to be a different environment than our daily environment. And so I call it a bit of a split screen. We need to make sure we understand our roots, our daily routines. We also need to have empathy and imagination. What are other people going through? What are they experiencing? And that's a really interesting challenge to, to try to understand and, and work our way through. So I would say we try to be as disciplined as we can be, never perfect uh, and always striving to do better. But as I say, it's, it's easy to stay motivated because when we see our scientists, we've got 250 people working. Uh, as you know, Tracy, our colleagues, when you see the dedication and hard work they put into it, well, it just takes a little bit for us to, to try to just tell their stories. We do have a remarkable team at CLS, don't we? Yeah. yeah, inspiring. And different perspectives are so important. Yeah, I think I think what's important and, and maybe this notion of inclusive science is, is getting in some traction, really getting uh, some attention that it deserves, that notions of, of who can be a scientist and uh, how best to, to work together I think it's really beginning to open up and science has always been universal. And what we know uh, is that that means regardless of anyone's background, regardless of their sexual orientation or their gender or their nationality or where they grew up, um, uh, who their mother is or who their father is, um, these are great scientists and they've earned through their own hard work, diligence, and talents, refined talents, uh, they've earned the opportunity to work at Canada's only synchrotron. And uh, that's just a wonderful, wonderful environment within which to work. Um, everyone brings their, their A game. And as a result, the team is very strong. Can we change topics a little bit? Sure, yeah. A lot of the students that we engage with would like to ask the question about salaries and mm -hmm. um, you know those kinds of things. So what kind of salary band would a uh, beginning entry level person in government relations be looking at? Well, I'll, I'll kind of go back in time because I think what's really important is, is to begin to, to say um, no one is likely to, to start at the top of that bandwidth. Yeah. And so speaking in real dollars, uh, I was working in parliament uh, as, uh, as a foreign policy advisor in the late 1990s, it's a long time ago now. Um, and I came to the University of Saskatchewan for a six month contract for $40,000 a year. And I stayed on contract, it was renewed uh, for about the next two or three years. It, it was not a permanent position. It was project-based. And I worked very, very hard. 
uh, for for um, for the university and for my colleagues and for my family. And so so if someone would would have said then here's here's where you're going to start, well I guess I guess that would only be part of the story. But as a wise man once said to me, it's not where you start, it's how much room there is for you to grow. And so when we think about um, being able to make more than $100,000 uh, and, and to work with colleagues and see other career paths um, that, that make similar uh, amounts of money and contribute to their family and contribute to our community, then I think that, that becomes really compelling. So uh, for me, it's about what that opportunity for advancement is and, and the reality is not simply at the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron, but, but in various sectors, um, it's not where you start, it's what potential you have and the potential is limitless. Um, last night I was, well, through Zoom, had the opportunity to, to listen to uh, Dr. Houghton, who's Canada's latest uh, Nobel laureate. He's at the University of Alberta. And, and there's an example of, of what he said was, was as he moved to Canada, um, you know, he had no idea uh, that, that one day that would lead to uh, a Nobel Prize. And so I would simply say, uh, it's about where you start. It's about rolling up your sleeves. It's about getting down to work and understanding that the potentials are limitless when we begin to talk about science. And when you started that first set of contracts for the University of Saskatchewan, at that time you had completed your bachelor's of, yep. uh, of arts, right? Yeah, I, I had an undergraduate degree in political science and uh, I, was, I was working on my master's degree. And so that was important to finish. Mm -hmm. uh, it, took, it took a lot of effort. We had a young family at the time and working full time and, and all the interests that come with uh, with with an early career, uh, but finishing my graduate degree was a was an important step, and that's again just part of that discipline of setting aside time. Uh, sometimes you need to trade off sleep, and uh, getting up really early and staying up late at night. But for the most part, time goes by anyway. And uh, again, the environment was so stimulating. The people I was working with and the projects I was able to, to work on uh, kind of fueled my interest on the academic side. And, and I guess what we would call kind of uh, professional and personal development through advanced education. It's not the only way. There are lots of other paths to, to professional and personal development, whether that could be playing the cello or, or through theater or, I, again, working for community-based organizations as a volunteer there are lots of ways to continue to make contributions and to grow, but, uh, but what's important is being engaged and understanding the environment. Within a post-secondary setting, um, education, formal education matters. So what do you think the future looks like for uh, your area of work in your field? You know, I, I, I would say that COVID has reinforced um, some very simple truths. And that is, uh, if, if we think research is expensive, you should try the alternative. And really what we've seen in the last year is the global economy um, lose about 5% of its steam. And, you know, millions of people be thrown out of work, displaced and disadvantaged. And well, honestly, scores uh, that have ultimately lost their lives. So science is going to continue to uh, be crucial for our well-being, for our prosperity, for our security moving forward. And as long as there's going to be science, synchrotrons are going to be absolutely crucial uh, because that bright light, millions of times brighter than the sun, provides so much data and information that I think synchrotron science is going to be increasingly important, increasingly strategic. And uh, I think those that have the capacity and willingness to help tell that story um, 
we'll we'll continue to see opportunities. Some of them actually, and it, it goes to some of the work that that you and others do, Tracy. You know, some of it is actually having access as summer students just to begin to to do some preliminary work. Some of it is about volunteering. Um, and that's again, just about being creative, using our, our creative and collective imaginations to say, you know, what, what opportunities are there? And uh, I would just recommend that, that uh, I guess they call it uh, STEM, some call it STEAM. I, I simply call it uh, science literacy, um, some capacity to engage the scientific world just can't do anyone wrong. Great, thank you for that. Um, so one question that I'd like to ask, what do you wish you knew before you kind of launched into your careers that you would tell your younger self now? You know, I, and, I, and I've, touched on, I've touched on this. Um, I, I would have taken and been far more studious in my pursuit of of the sciences and um uh, that that is just so important because uh it leads to to some fundamental knowledge that no matter what area of endeavor you're going to get in uh no matter where you're going to work where you're going to live uh what you're going to do as a hobby um science is behind it and so uh, embarrassingly I'm reading for the first time in my life, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, I ought to have read that when I was 18 or 19 years old. Uh, shame on me. I guess there, well, there's an old expression. There were kind of two times to, to address those problems. Once was, was maybe 30 years ago. Uh, the other one is today. And I'm taking up that challenge and, and really trying to understand some of the fundamental truths uh, and fundamental uh, elements of science behind the work that goes on at the synchrotron and on our, you know, on our campus more broadly. But uh, my, to my younger self, I would have sent a note and at the time we didn't have emails, but I, I would have written an email and said, you know, actually be far more diligent, uh, not simply for your career, but for your life. Knowing that you like to tell stories. Yeah. What has been your favorite experience connected to CLS so far? You know, it was, and, and this is where the privilege of, of working with really remarkable leaders. I was, I was, uh, I was, a, I was a young professional. Uh, I began thinking about the potential of the Canadian light source and what it meant for, for science, what it meant for the university and what it meant for our broader community in Saskatchewan. Um, and, and it allowed me to have a conversation with our university president, Peter McKinnon, uh, about seeing maybe Ottawa, instead of simply as our national capital, but also Canada's window on the world where uh, ambassadors and, and science attaches, science diplomats were going to be stationed. And I asked him one day if we might invite some of those ambassadors and science uh, diplomats to a briefing, to a, a presentation in Ottawa. And, and um, you know, he had the courage to say, let's try it. And it turned out uh, maybe better than we had anticipated. Maybe we were hoping for 30 people and maybe we had 90 or 100 show up. Uh, at the time, there were only 15 countries with synchrotron. So we really focused our invitations in and around those countries, but others, others became interested. And as a result, we invited all of those people uh, back to the Canadian Light Source. We were just getting started. It was 2004, 2005, and our construction was just wrapping up, and we were actually going to begin science. And two of the first to, to come, they came together. They were friends, was the British High Commissioner and the French Ambassador. We hosted a, a lunch for our business community over at Innovation Place, and um, as a result of that, uh, the British High Commissioner working with uh, Saskatchewan officials and, and federal government officials in, in Canada, um, we were given 
well, we were we were given the privilege of of having uh, our queen uh, visit the Canadian light source synchrotron, um, and that occurred in in two thousand and five, and and that was that was just a privilege to to help serve and and help coordinate, and so that was uh, that was one of those very special days in 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 a kind of professional life that uh, I had the, I had the privilege of being around and and maybe helping with and and yeah that was that was a special day for our synchrotron um that was the first visit to a synchrotron uh by by queen elizabeth and um it lifted our profile it lifted our prestige and it lifted uh our confidence on this campus and especially at the canadian light source so that that was a pretty special day i remember that day and 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 it really was it really was um and for the students that are watching this, <clears throat> there was a grade six, seven class that was able to participate in that day from uh, Bjorkdale, Saskatchewan. Yep. So that uh, was I, fun. You did, you know, you did important work uh, and, and so many others did where, um, where we really tried not simply to talk about the infrastructure. That was the, that was the setting, that was the backdrop but we really tried to find compelling science and community-based stories uh, for Her Majesty. Uh, and uh, I, I, think, um, I think everyone just brought their A, a game that day and, and uh, including um, those, those students. Yeah, it was, it was quite remarkable. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> so rolling back time even further, yep. what was your very first job? Uh, you know, I was very fortunate. I um, I grew up in in Red Deer, Alberta, and my first job, um, I was 14 years old, and I began working at a lumberyard. And so, uh, yeah, I had the privilege of of learning about uh, uh, two by fours and and good one side plywood and and how to drive a forklift, and and working with others. And so um, again. To begin to understand the significance of of industrial science uh, as well as industry, so that that was my first job, and um, you know that that helped set the tone. I I and continued to play hockey, and then I coached hockey, uh, but I worked in lumber yards up until uh, up until the time I was kind of in my early twenties. Um, I also had the privilege I went to uh, reserve basic training, and uh, I. I did that in, in Dundurn, Saskatchewan in 1987. I had some thoughts of actually having a military career, um, but something remarkable was happening internationally and that was the Cold War was ending and, and it provided me an opportunity to, uh, to experience the military, which I have great respect for and including those that serve our country and our allies. And at the same time, to see that the world was changing and, um, uh, some of my teachers, some of those mentors in my life said, you know, by all means, continue to think about a military career, but um, also continue to think about what peace is for and how we can help uh, achieve maybe uh, greater security and prosperity for, for others outside of the military realm because the world was changing so quickly. You mentioned mentors. Have you had particular mentors that you would like to, to mention? Boy, I, you know, I've been so fortunate. Um, uh, teachers, especially, I had, uh, I struggled early on as a student. Uh, I failed grade two. I couldn't read. Um, and, and so it was a teacher that put me up at the front of the class, uh, said, you know, you might, might need to go get your eyes checked. I began to wear glasses. Um, her name was Mrs. Mudd. I had a, another teacher, Mrs. Cohen, who, when we were in grade six, uh, had us write a 30 page paper, uh, about history. And, and at the time that seemed a daunting task, but it was about exploring other people and other places and other times. Uh, Dr. Ted Eisner was, was, uh, my high school philosophy teacher. Uh, Al Schachterly grew up in Govan, Saskatchewan. He was my shop teacher and allowed me to explore and, and help teach 
um, welding. And uh, Bob Lemieux grew up in Willowbunch, Saskatchewan. Uh, he was my first boss. Uh, Bob Mills was was my boss. He was the member of Parliament for Red Deer, and and he allowed me to, in my twenties, go serve on Parliament Hill as as one of his assistants. And then then you know, Dr. Gordon Barnhart, who became our Lieutenant Governor, uh, he he allowed me to work with him, learn from him as as he was teaching on our campus. Peter McKinnon, President Peter McKinnon, was remarkable, and uh, and. Just, just an exceptional mentor. And then obviously on the political side, uh, Premier Brad Wall, uh, to be able to, to work with and learn from and, and serve with uh, someone so esteemed was a rare privilege. And the list, you know, that list goes on. We can think about, uh, we can think about Rob Lamb, who's the CEO of the Canadian Light Source. We can think about Peter Stoichev, the, the current president of the University of Saskatchewan. That list goes on. But um, but early on it was it was teachers it was coaches, and uh, I had the the very uh, just a, a terrific blessing of a very very strong family and so uh, my parents and my sister my grandparents uh, played tremendous roles in helping me along the way but uh, but mentorship really really matters I guess I guess if there was one thing I would add is is uh, don't be afraid to to ask for a hand. And it's surprising once you have a goal, uh, how many people will rally behind and around you achieving that goal. If you're willing to work for it and you're willing to do the work, uh, a lot of people, including strangers, they, those, you know, your neighbors and your friends and, and, and distant family members, they begin to rally around you and say, if that's your goal, uh, you'd just be surprised what kind of momentum that creates. Excellent. Well, we're kind of uh, winding down a bit as we're, we've been talking for quite a long time here. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would like to wrap up with, a final message to students or a story you want to share? You know, I think, I think from, from where I sit, the, the, final, the final message or final story, and, and, uh, and I hesitate to, you know, to, to really kind of sound as if, as if, it's, it's an important lesson learned and it's universal, but it's just simply um, one word, maybe three times over. And, and it is uh, prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, prepare for your job interviews. Um, it's a lot easier now than it used to be. <laughs> um, track down that information, spend an extra hour or two, uh, finding out about post-secondary institutions or potential employers, uh, about your potential boss or business partners. Uh, try to, to really understand the world through their lens. What are their interests? What are their objectives? Uh, how can you help not simply see the benefits come to yourself, but how can you help others achieve their goals? And uh, that for me is about preparation. And um, that, that, as they say, three times over, and I have to remind myself every day, uh, preparation, 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 uh, keep reading, keep learning, keep listening. And uh, that, that, would be my, that would be my kind of motto that I would leave the students with. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time and your stories and your advice. It's uh, really very much appreciated. Tracy, thanks so much for, for your hard work, your leadership, uh, and, and everything you're doing to make synchrotron science in Canada more accessible and more exciting, especially for students. <laughs>